Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. A flash of his badge didn't help a Bear County deputy who was pulled over for suspicion of driving while intoxicated. The sheriff's office has pushed back to combat the issue, but is it working? The defenders take a look coming up, but first. And you on the night beat a car found with bullet holes two blocks away. The victim was found. Police are working this shooting case. Officers say a 28 year old man was shot multiple times. This happening on the city's east side. That man managed to make it to the Walter Food Mart on Burnett Street near the intersection of Walters. The victim was taken to a hospital with life threatening injuries. Police believe this shooting may have happened two blocks away where they found an abandoned car with bullet holes. A neighborhood in shock tonight after one of their own died at the hands of San Antonio police this afternoon. That man has been identified by his family as 55 year old Daryl Zamalt. Chief William McManus says according to preliminary information, Zamalt grabbed an officer's gun and another officer shot him. The night team's Jeffany Gray with a reaction tonight from his friends and family. They come to the house in an unmarked van in regular clothing to serve him and to shoot him and kill him in the back. It's not just, it's, it's unjust. Susie Zamalt is both frustrated and heartbroken, learning that her father, 55-year-old Daryl Zamalt, was shot and killed by an SAPD officer on Willie Drive on the west side. Chief William McManus says police officers were serving two domestic violence arrest warrants this afternoon. Neighbors say Daryl was outside staining furniture at the time of the encounter. The officer grabbed him to place him under arrest. He fought, uh, he hit the officer in the face with a can of paint. McManus says a struggle took place, which had a fatal result. The suspect was able to pull the officer's gun from his holster. The two fought over the gun. One of the, one of the officers fired one shot. Margie Alejo describes herself as a good friend and close neighbor of Daryl's. She says she just got off work when she realized what happened. As a nurse, she was devastated that she couldn't help. I had to be across the street watching my neighbor pass away in front of me. That's very heartbroken, you know. Like Alejo, several other neighbors also in disbelief. I guarantee you can ask every single person on this block and not one person will have a negative thing to say about that guy. According to Bear County criminal records, Darrell was out on bond for stalking and two counts of assault of a peace officer. He previously served time in jail for resisting arrest. The family is demanding body cam footage be released. McManus says it will be released when it's allowed by law. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, District 5 Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez releasing a statement about the shooting that happened in her district. It says in part, quote, we need to be smarter about how we fund and work on social and mental health needs and not place the burden on police who are trained to respond with force, end quote. For her full statement, visit our website at ksat.com. An identity now released in last night's deadly crash in East Bear County. The medical examiner identifying the woman killed as 31 year old Adriana Moore. She was thrown from a truck along FM 1518 near Loop 1604 after she lost control of that truck and it rolled several times. It's unclear what exactly caused that crash. The medical examiner is still working to identify the person killed in a big rig crash on the city's northeast side. Investigators say an 18 wheeler exiting I 35 when the truck suffered a possible brake failure. The truck ended up hitting two cars near Thousand Oaks. One of the victims, a 37 year old man, died at the scene. The other transported to a hospital in serious condition. The driver of the truck was not injured. City health officials hoping numbers remain on trend as we move closer to marking two weeks after Labor Day. There were 115 new COVID-19 cases reported today in Bear County, along with three new deaths. Tonight, another decrease in COVID-19 patients in local hospitals. 228 people are hospitalized, 105 in intensive care, and for the first time in quite a while, the number of people on ventilators has dipped below 50 to 47. Now to a night beat update and a story of survival. His fight against COVID-19 led to a medically induced coma for 56 days. Now the San Antonio pediatric nurse has woken up. Justin Vine hospitalized on June 30th. His wife shared his story saying he was placed on a ventilator and given a plasma donation and the drug remdesivir. Justin began showing improvements just late last month and tonight we're hearing from him for the very first time. Still on the ventilator 56 days. It was just a waiting game really. And 
guess it's a miracle, to be honest with you, that I'm even here. The doctor had told my wife I didn't have much more time. I'm very, very happy, very happy to be, to be with him because I couldn't see him for two months and just being here with him, it's, you know, it's a blessing. You can see Justin smile there. You know his wife smiling as well. Justin is still in the hospital, but COVID free. He's scheduled to start rehab on Thursday and looks forward to seeing his children when he gets out of the hospital. That will be a reunion. Yeah. Trying to make sure that families can keep a roof over their heads amid a pandemic. On Thursday, the San Antonio City Council will vote whether to put another $21.9 million toward the city's COVID-19 emergency housing assistance program. The council is also proposing to make some changes. Instead of a three-month or $5,000 limit on that assistance, applicants would only get a little more than one month's worth of funding. The pandemic left 10,000 people in San Antonio jobless, but a program that literally pays to learn could help. The night team's Patty Santos tells us the training and workforce solutions Alamo starts at the end of the month, but there's already a surge of people interested. More than 270 on-site training jobs are ready for the taking, says Adrian Lopez, CEO of Workforce Solutions Alamo. Qualified participants can get paid up to $450 a week while training for a new career. Be warehousing, painters in child development centers, um, you know, forklift operators, materials handlers, uh, people who are in productions, right, foremen, uh, welding and uh, stamping. The need and interest in the COVID-19 workforce recovery program is great, he says. About a thousand people have called and applied to be a part of a training that hasn't even started yet. So far, about 400 people have been deemed eligible for the city program. This is our approach to helping our residents get back into the workforce. The city says in a time of crisis, it's important to help people pivot into careers where jobs are readily available, like healthcare, construction, and technology. Many of those in the hardest hit industries of hospitality, food service, and retail already have the qualifications and attitude for careers they might have never considered. What you hear from, from industry leaders is, yeah, we want some level of skill set and people who want to sort of kind of have a very positive attitude to be able to come in and even if they haven't, you know, figured out things, they can, you know, learn. The workforce training program is also available through Project Quest, Alamo Colleges, and other development agencies. Workforce Solutions Alamo says it's fielding hundreds of calls daily about this program, that it's tied up their phone lines. They've invested $100,000 into a new system, they say, will speed up the process. We have information about this on KSAT.com. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Bear County has a similar training program called Access Career Training and New Opportunities for Work, or ACT NOW. Workforce Solutions received a $14 million grant for that program. About 300 people have already been deemed eligible. Bear County managing to adopt a budget that is $5 million less than last year's budget. Commissioners did cut deputy constable staff to save more than a million dollars. 19 deputy constable positions are being deleted as commissioners say the workload is expected to decrease for constables. More than a million dollars allocated in the county budget for a mental health response plan. The Office of Criminal Justice set to contract with the South Texas Regional Advisory Council or STRAC to make that happen. This would allow for the determination on how to answer and who to send when a mental health 911 call comes in. And despite the pandemic, the power behind elections remains strong. Today, a drive through event to get voters registered safely held at the AT&T Center. You didn't even have to leave your car. Move Texas partnered with the Spurs to make it all happen. The event didn't start until 6 tonight, but people were already lining up at 4 this afternoon. One woman brought her 90-year-old mother to register to vote for the very first time. Deborah Hardwick says back then her father was the one who would go out and vote. But these are different times. She wants her vote to count because she feels that a, a need for everyone to vote this year. Voting for the very first time at 90. Wow. The AT&T Center is slated to be a mega voting site. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says commissioners voted to add more early voting sites for nearly 50 polling places this year. Wolf also says there will be an extension in voting hours. He says polls will be open until 6 p.m. the first week of October 13th. The next week, they're going to stay open until 8 p.m. And the week after that, polls will remain open until 10 p.m.
We are just days away from the launch of season two of KSAT Explains. And for our first episode, we're taking on a topic that affects this entire city, transportation. Compared to transit agencies in other major Texas cities, VIA has a lot less money to work with. It's one of the largest transit agencies that receives fewer operating dollars compared to Dallas, Austin, and Houston. The night team's Jaffany Gray with a look at how San Antonio stacks up. The important in the bus is it's pretty important because right now I got to get to work from my mom every, and everybody because she's out of a job. When COVID hit, I started riding the buses. 17-year-old Thalia Vasquez is one of the many people who rely on VIA to get to work. Transportation experts say reliable public transportation provides more opportunities for people in the same situation as Thalia and her family. We have a big city and the, the opportunity for people to access quality jobs in school and other um, uh, resources, including groceries, is not the same throughout our city. And that's where transportation comes in. But funding is crucial for providing reliable public transit. I understand VIA does not work for people right now. That's because it's a sprawling, massive city and the transit agency is so, so underfunded. Take a look at this chart. This is the sales tax revenue for fiscal year 2018 for Dallas area rapid transit, Capital Metro in Austin, Houston Metro, and VIA. All of them make more revenue than VIA. That's because Dallas, Austin, and Houston get one full cent from sales tax. VIA currently receives five eighths of a cent. The city of San Antonio has done a lot with limited resources uh, with VIA. VIA's latest annual financial report says the transit agency is the most efficient system compared to other Texas transit agencies. Despite receiving fewer operating dollars, congestion on San Antonio roads isn't too bad. Right now, Austin, Houston, and Dallas all rank worse than San Antonio. But that will change as more people move to the Alamo City. If you want to envision what our streets and transportation network would look like, if all that Austin traffic was in San Antonio on top of what we have today. That was just a preview of what you can expect this Thursday when we launch season two of KSAT Explains. The first episode focused on transportation, specifically the struggle to fund via what transportation options we have now and where our city needs to move going forward. You can watch the episode on KSAT TV's app and any way that you stream starting on Thursday. Pretty seasonable day today. High temperature, 92 degrees, the average being 90. No big changes temperature wise. Our rain chances will be rising a little bit in the days ahead. We'll talk about that. The latest on Hurricane Sally. And you see the big plume of, of smoke stretching all the way across the nation. Will we get any of that from the West Coast wildfires? We'll talk about that coming right up. Thanks, Adam. And a nurse coming forward with allegations at an immigration facility and the treatment of women happening there. That complaint filed and how immigration officials are now responding. Plus, the defenders take a look at drunk driving as it has plagued the Bear County Sheriff's Office. When was the tipping point and has the sheriff's approach worked? The defenders investigation next on the night beat. They chose to drive after they'd been drinking, despite knowing the consequences. Two Bear County Sheriff's deputies lost their jobs after being arrested for DWI. That's my career right now, working in Bear County Jail, and if you get all thrown away right now, they're going to fire me. As the night team's Dylan Collier reports, BCSO has made undeniable strides recently to address what was once one of their bigger black eyes for the agency, drunk driving. It's tonight's Defenders Report. When Deputy Michael Magana was pulled over for suspicion of driving while intoxicated following a night at Cowboys Dance Hall in June 2017. You're all over the road. I mean, bad. It took him a little over a minute to pull the do you know who I am card, literally taking out his deputy sheriff's credentials and flashing them to the right. San Antonio police officer right. here, who had stopped him. Okay, here, okay, County, you, you uh, need to put your credentials away, okay? Here's the thing. Yes, sir. You're suspected of a crime right now. I, I understand that, you know, what are you, deputy or uh, uh, law enforcement or jailer? Yes, sir. Which one are you, jailer or deputy? Okay, this Joe. Okay. All right, look. 
You're not going to get any special privileges from me. Logano failed a field sobriety test, and despite some additional procrastination on his part... I'm not going to jeopardize my job for you. I turn around. Okay, turn around. He was booked for DWI. I'm tired of, of being looked at that way. Sheriff Javier Salazar said it's exactly this type of behavior he has spent a majority of his first term in office trying to eradicate. Magana went to trial in the summer of 2019 and was found guilty. He resigned in lieu of being terminated from BCSO days after he was convicted. To me, that's just, that's just more of what we've been tolerating over the years, over the generations. And I, at some point, you got to just say stop, draw the line in the sand and say we're not tolerating it anymore. Salazar called 2018 the tipping point for needing to address drunk driving issues within his rank and file. 24 deputies were arrested that year alone, a significant portion of them on DWI-related offenses. That July, Deputy Libmar Rodriguez found himself in handcuffs after he failed a field sobriety test in a motel parking lot along Interstate 10. Instead of taking responsibility for his actions that night, Rodriguez blamed the arresting officer, claiming his job as a probationary deputy was all that he had. You know you're ruining my life, right? Rodriguez was fired hours after his arrest. In June 2019, he pleaded guilty to a reduced charge. What looked like a narrative of BCSO drunk driving arrests stacking up year after year has reversed course. Since the start of 2020, only a single deputy, Corporal Susan Palomo, has been charged with DWI. The agency formed a partnership with Alcoholics Anonymous, which now appears at in-service days. And its staff psychologist works with deputies who may have an alcohol addiction before those issues surface in a public arrest. Salazar says improvements to civil service rules now disqualify deputies for rehire, even if they beat the charge in court. When you're hurting for manpower, you know, you have to fight that urge to say, well, he got dismissed, let's bring him back. No, I changed civil service where I can't take that person back if I want to. As Salazar knocks on wood, he concedes that time will tell if the positive trend continues. For the Defender, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. As part of KSAT's election fairness policy, we asked Sheriff Salazar's challenger in the November election for comment on the sheriff's efforts to combat DWIs among staff. In a statement, candidate Jerry Rickoff called it another uh, after the fact attempt to treat a symptom and not the disease by the sheriff and said that deputy staffing and morale are both down. He also said the deputies who break the law should be arrested. You can read Rickoff's entire statement on our website right now on KSAT.com. All right, take a look at this. Smoke from the raging wildfires on the West Coast reached the eastern seaboard. These images from a NASA satellite show clouds of smoke stretching coast to coast. Could they shift south towards us? I know, Adam, that you have taken a look at this. We talked a little bit about it at 6 earlier today. I'm wondering, does rain help with that at all? Well, it can pick up some of the particulates and drop it out of the air. And so it can okay. uh, and can get rid of some of it. But really, these are fine particles that get blown around across a, across the country and beyond. I mean, across the northern hemisphere, we'll have some of this uh, transported across the Atlantic. So let's talk about it. Let's look at that satellite imagery and I can manipulate it here from NASA, that imagery, and you'll see these little orange dots, and let's focus on the west coast, those fires out west. Those orange dots are the active fires, and especially the biggest ones here, California, up into Oregon, and even a little bit in eastern Washington, but mostly Oregon and California here. See the big smoke plumes? Well, all this haze that blurs out the map, that is smoke transported eastward all the way to Washington, D.C., Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, and even into the Atlantic Ocean right now. Look at that off the coast of Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Eastward, that little brown area, that is some of that smoke. So the wind picks it up, takes it all over the place. So far around here in Texas, we have a little bit of that smoke in the air, but not high concentrations. However, look at our forecast. This is the model data that we have that helps us figure out where this is going to be transported. We get into Thursday. We'll still have some light volumes of that smoke higher in our sky. Then we get into Saturday and it looks like we'll get clipped by one of the more moderate plumes of smoke and that's from the Western wildfires. Most of us aren't going to notice it. It'll just give the 
sky a little extra color, especially at sunrise and sunset and a little extra haze during the day, kind of like when we have the agricultural fires in Mexico and Central America in May and June. All right, so let's talk about rainfall since yesterday. Some nice swaths southeast of San Antonio, but nothing locally. Our rain chances go up just a little bit, slightly better coverage as we get into Thursday and Friday. At that point, about 40%. Bigger picture across Texas is pretty quiet right now, but you can't help but notice Hurricane Sally just about to make landfall. Basically, Mississippi. Florida line there. This is a category one storms max sustained winds at 85 miles per hour, pushing actually very slowly drifting to the northeast, likely to make landfall early tomorrow morning around the Destin Pensacola beach area, uh, just west of Dead Destin and then moving off to the northeast as it dissipates into the southeastern US. But a big rainmaker already has dumped between five and nine inches along the coast of Alabama, and Florida likely 20 inches plus in some areas because it's such a slow mover. 70s to near 80 right now at the airport. We're 83, 84 Carrizo Springs, 74 in Kerrville by tomorrow morning. We'll start the day at 74 degrees, partly cloudy, an isolated pop up shower or two here and there. They'll be dotting the landscape again, mainly east of San Antonio. 30% chance 92 the high temperature tomorrow back into the upper 80s by Thursday, Friday through the weekend and that slightly enhanced rain chance to round out the work week Thursday and Friday. All right, not too bad. Thanks, Adam. All right, no matter what you think about UTSA's new coach, the guy loves football <laughs> and the players love him. They have bought into his system incredibly in an incredible short amount of time. Remember, they didn't have a spring, right. a very short fall workout, and now here they are in the middle of their season, and already things are getting emotional for this new head coach. When we come back, we'll show you why. And 6A Volleyball is back starting tonight. Coming up. Now that the UTSA Roadrunners have won their season opener, they'll try and do the same in their home opener this Saturday in the Alamo Dome when they host Stephen F. Austin in their COVID-19 adjusted schedule. The Lumberjacks accepted an invitation to play in San Antonio since it's the alma mater of new head coach Jeff Trailer. But before that happens, an emotional moment today when Coach Trailer and his starting quarterback Frank Harris were asked about Harris's tweet after their dramatic 51-48 double overtime victory over Texas State in San Marcos. A tweet congratulating his head coach on his first ever victory as a college head football coach almost driving trailer to tears. He believed in me way early. Uh, I don't know why he did, but he did. And uh, I'll always be grateful. Uh, my first quarterback at Kilmer, his name's Olin Johnson. Uh, he believed in me very early in my career. And uh, it got me where I am today. He's currently coaching in Gilmer and sent me an amazing text before the game. Uh, those, are, those are the reasons I do it. Uh, those 488 texts. Uh, at least 300 other players, and uh, that's that's why it means a lot to me. That's my guy. Uh, easy to play for. He's a man of his word. If you know who he is, uh, and we love him. Uh, we bought into him. Um, he's a player coach, and I'm telling you, there's not many guys like him, especially in the college world. In the college world, uh, at the head coaching position. And there you go. Coach Trailer added they will still be down at least eight players who are left out of the season opener due to contact tracing, but does expect it to be cleared by Friday. However, since they have not practiced, won't be available for Saturday's 2 p.m. kickoff. Another honor of Texas senior quarterback Sam Ellinger today. The Austin native was named the Earl Campbell Tyler Rose Award National Player of the Week. This after Ellinger threw for a career high 426 yards and five touchdowns in the Longhorns 59 3 season opening route of UTEP. Now, due to the COVID 19 pandemic, the Horns don't play again until September the 26th when they travel to Lubbock to take on Texas Tech to begin conference play. That will help Jordan Whittington recover from minor surgery to repair a meniscus tear in his knee. So head coach Tom Herman was asked if that would mean more playing time for sophomore walk on Kai Money who scored his first touchdown on Saturday. He was certainly uh, the personification of his last name Saturday night, so that was good. Kai has proven that, that he's uh, uh, a guy that can really, really help us. And, you know, if, if circumstances dictate, we, we have no problem putting him in the game and, and knowing that, that he'll deliver. Now, one big thing working against Texas Tech is that the Red Raiders have been hit hard by the coronavirus, with as many as 75 of their 123 players on the active roster testing positive since June. Five more as of Monday. 
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. When the Dallas Cowboys opened their season on Sunday Night Football, one player took a knee during the National Anthem, and it was the newest Cowboy, Don Terry Poe, who came to Dallas during the offseason as a free agent defensive tackle, becoming their first member of the Dallas Cowboys to ever kneel during the National Anthem to protest social injustice. Now, you may remember team owner Jerry Jones has been very much against that in the past, so Jerry was asked on his weekly radio show today how he thought his players handled the situation. I thought uh, they, uh, our players, uh, I thought they gave it the sensitivity. Uh, they showed uh, respect to Poe's uh, decision. Uh, they did show a sensitivity to our fans as a team. Uh, all in all, I, I thought our team uh, uh, was uh, uh, very real, very genuine in the way it approached it. All right, the big game and a big game coverage coming up next. The big game and our big game coverage this Friday night will feature the number five ranked Batlin Billies of Fredericksburg in the sub 5A 12's top 12 against number six Wimberley Texans in Wimberley. The Batlin Billies have started their 2020 season undefeated with wins over Monahans, Gerald, and Gonzalez by outscoring their opponents on an average of 52 to 13, led by quarterback Cole Emmel. He has six touchdowns in the air, four rushing already. The Wimberley Texans are coming out their first loss of the season, undefeated Lampasas 57 28, but before that had beaten Canyon Lake 24 22, Quero 33 14 after going to state last year. Now the two 4E teams collide on Friday night. Wimberley is going to be a good test for going forward into our district. Um, you know, Land Passes is a great team. Uh, they're going to be hard to beat, but um, it'll be good to see where we're at and what we need to work on. Wimberley is always good and it's a good opponent and I love playing good teams just to make us better. They're three you know they got a little bit of momentum going on right now and we got to crush that going forward. Fred, they're, they're, they're a pretty good team. They got a Few good athletes on their team. I think it's going to be a really good game. Got to come out. Got to come out hard first half, and we got to do what we, do what we do best. All right, kickoff in Wimberley set for 7:30. In case that 12 sports will be there on Friday. The volleyball season has officially begun for the Class 6A schools. A good matchup tonight in New Braunfels. Canyon hosting the Unicorns. Home team up two sets to one, but New Braunfels battling back at the fourth set. Chloe Ulrich with a spike that cuts the lead to two, but Canyon answers right back. Kyla Malone serves up the ace, capping a 4-0 run, and then it's Aaron Jones hammering one off the blocker and out. Cougarettes win it in three sets to one. More highlights and reaction on our website later tonight. Good to see the ladies back playing in 5A and 6A levels starting this week. Yeah, and football starts another week. Another week. Well, some, and then there's some that start a week after that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it'll be week one, week one, week five. Got, Got it? it? Glad <laughs> well, you're here, Greg. We'll have a flow chart on Friday. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Greg. Racial unrest, his response to the pandemic and health care. All questions brought to President Donald Trump during tonight's town hall. We're going to hear from the president next. President Donald Trump answering questions directly from uncommitted voters tonight, taking part in the 2020 special, The President and the People. As ABC's Alex Perche reports, the president addressing his response to COVID-19, health care and racial unrest across the country. Welcome to our town hall. With president, president Trump in Philadelphia tonight, taking questions from uncommitted voters as part of the 2020 special, The President and the People, with ABC chief anchor George Stephanopoulos. The first topic, the coronavirus. I wanted to always play it down. In those recorded interviews with journalist Bob Woodward, released to CNN, President Trump admitted to downplaying the COVID threat. Well, I didn't downplay it. I actually, in many ways, I upplayed it in terms of action. My action was very strong. Yourself? His rival, former Vice President Joe Biden, saying otherwise during a roundtable with veterans today in the battleground state of Florida. The reason why the COVID crisis has been so bad, he has focused only on making sure the stock market stays up. ABC News offered to host a similar town hall with Biden. The network in the campaign could not find a mutually agreeable date. During tonight's special, President Trump was also pressed on health care. I interviewed you in June of last year. You said the health care plan would come in two weeks. You told Chris Wallace that this summer it would come in three weeks. You promised an executive order on pre-existing. I have it already. But it's you. Though he would not commit to when that plan would be unveiled. And in the wake of police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the shooting of Jacob Blake, president facing questions about race and police reform. Do you feel racial injustices are occurring in this nation? Well, I think they were tragic events. If you look at our police, they do a phenomenal job. You'll have people choke, make mistakes. If you're going to stop crime, we have to give the 
the respect back to the police that they deserve. But you have yet to address and acknowledge okay. that there's been a race problem in America. So if you go, well, I hope there's not a race problem. I can tell you there's none with me. Near the end of the night, the president was asked about his critics who have said that his behavior is not presidential. President Trump saying that he's fighting a lot of forces, adding that sometimes you don't have time to be totally, as you would say, presidential. Joe Biden has a similar style event on another network on Thursday. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. Around America tonight, a whistleblower filing a complaint against an immigration and customs facility in Georgia. A licensed practical nurse who used to work there alleges widespread medical neglect of women who are being held there. In that complaint, Don Wooten detailed a high rate of hysterectomies performed on the female detainees at the Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia. The surgery removes a woman's uterus, leaving her unable to become pregnant. Wooten complained about one doctor in particular, saying, quote, everybody he sees has a hysterectomy, and quote, everybody's uterus cannot be that bad, end quote. Immigration and Customs Enforcement said it does not comment on matters presented to the Inspector General. A multi-million dollar settlement announced in the Breonna Taylor case. She was shot to death in her own home by police back in March in Louisville, Kentucky. Her boyfriend says they were asleep when officers broke down the door and started firing. The family of the 26-year-old EMT will receive $12 million from the city of Louisville after filing a wrongful death lawsuit. The city also agreeing to implement policy changes in the police department, including requiring commanders to approve all search warrants before going to a judge. One of the three officers involved in Taylor's death was fired. None of them, though, have been criminally charged. It is a team effort. KSAT Community teaming up with HEB Pharmacy, Bear County and Freeman Coliseum to help you get your annual flu shots. The flu shots will be on a first come first serve appointment basis for this event. So mark your calendars for September 26th. This flu shot drive is happening from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. We have a link to sign up, which you must do ahead of time. You can find that link online at KSAT.com. Check out live cam tonight, 83 degrees out there. And you know, when you see the skies in Portland, Huh? and Seattle and San Francisco. I mean, the wildfires are having an effect in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their, their air quality is very, very poor right now. And it's actually to the point where, you know, they're telling people to stay inside and also uh, don't use your vacuum cleaner as often because, you know, that kicks up air and mm -hmm. can re-stir the particulates that are in oh, the air wow. inside your home. And you know, just some of those little things that you wouldn't necessarily think of. I know a lot of vacuum cleaners have filters, but they still do have a bit of exhaust that can then stir up those fine particulates. We're okay with that around here. We're, we don't have any of that to worry about. The aquifer took a little bit of a hit today, down seven tenths of a foot. We're still about three feet above the monthly average, but stage one water restrictions. Ragweed, Fall Elm and Mold, all or Ragweed and Fall Elm, moderate mold on the low end. All right, let's take a look at our imagery from today. You see the widely separated showers and storms east of I-35 throughout the day today, giving a few areas a good soaking, but uh, most of us were dry, and that'll be the case again tomorrow. A little upper level swirl to the north of us will drop in, and that'll enhance our rain chances just a little bit. Uh, slightly more numerous showers in the afternoon hours by Thursday and Friday. We'll give that a 40% chance. And then of course you look off to our east and the story is Hurricane Sally, category one hurricane right now with max sustained winds at 85 miles per hour and some gusts up to 105. It actually re-strengthened a little bit this evening with the latest update. And you see a better defined eye here in the most recent uh, passes by the satellite. So it definitely strengthened a little bit, but this is just crawling to the north northeast at two miles per hour. I mean, two miles per hour. That is nothing. It's practically sitting there. And that's why it's already dumped five to nine inches along the Mississippi and Florida coastline there, right along the basically the state line. Making landfall early tomorrow morning as a category one, most likely near Pensacola area, Fort Walton Beach roughly, and then weakening as it moves into Georgia by Thursday. It's gonna have a lot of rain. I mean, we're talking over 20 inches likely here in Alabama 
and extreme far western panhandle of Florida. So flooding the big issue. Right now we're at 83 degrees. A dew point is 68, so a bit of mugginess in the air. Some 60s and 70s in other parts of Texas. Marfa 64. It's a good time to be in West Texas. Amarillo, it's always a good time to be in West Texas if you ask me, but I'm biased. I just got my odd dad uh, mountain back actually the other day. Yeah, I got a European mountain. Beautiful. Ooh, love it. Anyway, all right, so temperatures, 70s in the hill country, near 80 degrees elsewhere. Tomorrow morning, mid 70s locally, say 74 San Antonio, 73 Gonzales, 71 Hondo, but some upper 60s in the hill country. Then we get into the afternoon. By and large, we'll be in the lower 90s on our Wednesday afternoon. A 30% chance of a few showers, so uh, some isolated activity, but mainly I think by and large will be dry. Thursday and Friday, slightly better chances there, back up to 40%. This weekend, actually some lower humidity, sunshine, mornings in the 60s and afternoons in the upper 80s. You know, I didn't know taxidermists could actually mount crawdads. <laughs> Aw, dad, thank you. <laughs> Sure, Adam, it was a European mount. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. It's, it's rowdy. It what else? <laughs> All right. Thanks, Adam. Still ahead, one San Antonio small business owner working to beat the odds during this pandemic. Juan Rios sharing his story with us coming up. And take a look at this video. This robust robot stocking shelves at a convenience store. We're going to see it pretty soon, I can tell. That's the guy behind the Okay, him. yeah, he's the guy behind Ignore, Ignore the man behind the curtain. Yeah. But first, COVID-19 in Bear County, our KSAP Q&A with Metro Health Medical Director, Dr. Jinda Wu, up next. We are seeing a lot of the numbers move in the right direction when it comes to COVID-19 here locally in San Antonio and in Bear County. So to get some context on where we are headed and the work we still need to be doing, we want to bring in Dr. Junda Wu, the medical director with San Antonio Metro Health for today's KSAT Q&A. Doctor, thanks for being with us. Let's first talk about schools. We heard uh, from the mayor in today's daily briefing that right now the risk for schools still sits at the low end of moderate. Can you tell us exactly what that means for schools? What should parents, teachers, administrators really be considering when it comes to that risk? So the one thing that would tip us over into that green zone where we'd be comfortable with a larger level of reopening is the positivity rate. Right now, it's at 6%. Um, last week, it was at 6.7%. I don't know that people thought we would get, we would drop as quickly as we have in the last month to get where we are, but we're still not at 5%, which is a commonly used cutoff nationally and even globally. So we ask that people keep on doing everything that we've been asking, even though you're really tired, uh, so that we can keep on driving this number in the right direction and bring kids back into school safely. Yeah, it, because it's working. I mean, we, we've seen the positivity rate go from double digits and now we've seen it slowly get to that 5%, which to me honestly seemed unrealistic just a few weeks ago and we were like thinking we could get it down to 5%. So things are working, let's keep it going. I, I also have a question. I mean, some schools have already started to expand their in-person teaching your thoughts on that and, and you know what you should look for if you're a parent when you're taking your kids to school or you know a janitor or a teacher or anybody yeah so our recommendations at metro health were within this range uh, to bring in small groups and really focus on those students who have special needs or don't have internet access or um, otherwise are, are the ones that are a priority for in-person learning where, where, you know, the remote learning is really just not working because we also recognize as part of the whole picture of health that the school has so many benefits for, for our young people. Um, so it's a very individual and difficult decision. The CDC does have some checklists that parents can look at to help you balance what what's important to you and what to look for in your communications from your school. 
We are uh, a week out from a lot of schools opening their campuses up to in-person learning. That happened a week ago. We know two weeks has really been that key time frame. We have to wait and see uh, what the significance of a certain event may be on potential spread in, in our community. So, like Labor Day, too. Like yeah. Labor Day, yes. So are yeah. what are you expecting to see now that we have passed Labor Day and we, schools have begun in-person learning? We're about halfway through that two week period. What are you looking for? Yeah, so we're waiting. If I can jump back for one second to the last question, that, that questionnaire or the checklist that I talked about, the CDC one, is linked on the school section of our website at covid19.sanantonio.gov. So going back to um, what right now, I, like everybody else, we're waiting to see the numbers and did how how good was everybody did people do what we asked for, for um we are starting now because of the lag time that you mentioned to see some reports in from um well actually from the 8th the 9th the 10th because there's also a, a lag time in people people getting sick, people getting tested and then after they get tested they tell their school and then after that the school tells us right so so those things are starting to work their way through the pipeline. Um, we, we have seen a, a few outbreaks already. An outbreak is defined as two connected cases. And so none of these are big. In fact, they're two cases. <laughs> um, but but we, we have seen that. We have expected that. We are here for the schools to be a resource. and. When you have a small number of students, like we're recommending, then it's a lot easier to manage any outbreak. Metro Health has so many things that they do in a normal year, in a normal day, in a normal month. Uh, influenza shots, different infectious disease shots, different things going on. When you add a pandemic onto the plate, what did that do to Metro Health early on and where are we today? Early on, uh, I, I think it's safe to say there are times when it was crushing. Um, it, it, it felt like we were drowning under the number of cases. Three quarters of our staff was pulled to work on COVID. It was all hands on deck. I even did some case investigations. There were other you know, directors who did some case investigations. Um, we did get some relief from the CARES Act funding and the additional staff um, from our partnership with UT, uh, the UT School of Public Health. So all of that has helped a lot. Um, and uh, we, we don't want to go back there. So please keep up what you're doing. We, we really appreciate the way that everybody has, um, you know, done the things that we've asked to do keep that distancing, to do the masking. Um, it is making a difference. Keep it up. Thank you. And we appreciate all the work that you and your staff have done and continue to do throughout this entire pandemic. Dr. Wu, San Antonio Metro Health Medical Director, thanks for being with us. Thank you. We'll be right back. All right, take a look at this. It may look like the start of a virtual video game, but this is the man behind the controls of a seven foot robot with three fingers on each of its hands. That robot working at a convenience store in Tokyo. There you see it. It's equipped with cameras, microphone sensors. It can stock shelves. The Japanese startup Tell Existence developed the robot, which is named Model T after the iconic Ford. I don't it, I was going to say he could just do that himself, right? Does he need a rope? <laughs> Doesn't seem nearly as fun. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about that's it. That's true. A San Antonio small businessman has hit some hard times amid the pandemic, but despite that, he says he does not want to quit. As we head into Hispanic Heritage Month, 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz introduces us to a man who's made a career out of needle and thread. Hello. How are you? Hi, how are you? It's a long way from Saville Row, but inside this modest shop, Juan Rios is making San Antonio more dapper. He's a tailor, spiffing up corporate suits, doctors, lawyers. First of all, if you are a doctor and you don't dress well, nobody's going to 
want to go with you. I mean, it's the same as the lawyers. No problema. Rios learned his trade as a child in Mexico. A move to Chicago had him working for Ralph Lauren Polo and launching his small business, Chicago Custom Tailor Shop. Moving here 25 years ago, he kept the name and sewed up success. But since spring, there hasn't been enough work to pay his few employees. It is worry because, I mean, you know, the bills don't stop. So for the first time in his career, he got a loan, a PPP loan. He may be the exception. It's been a challenge for many minority-owned small businesses to get a loan from the government's payroll protection program. You have to talk the bank lingo or you're not, you know, you're not seen as a successful business. That's where Lift Fund comes in. Not only is the nonprofit micro lender helping small struggling businesses access cash, it educates too. And eventually you graduate from our program because you've got that financial know-how on how to uh, present your numbers uh, and be able then to go to the traditional banks. My name is Juan Rios, my card is there. As for Rios, he hopes more work comes in before the money runs out, leaving him hanging by a thread. I don't want to quit. You know, I'm going to do whatever I can to stay alive. I hope I can survive. Thank you. We'll see you. Friday. Friday. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, tomorrow morning, 74 degrees to start the day, partly cloudy in that 20 to 30 percent chance by the afternoon. We'll be making it into the low 90s for high temperatures. Then we're limited to the upper 80s, looks like Thursday through the upcoming weekend. And we don't mind that one bit. Yeah, a little <laughs> rain mixed in. It's all good. That's it for the night beat. GMSA at 430. Have a great night.